Hey friends, welcome back to Acre Homestead. We've got a busy day today. We need to do some preservation projects. Tomorrow I want to go down to the garden and do a huge harvest. We, I think it's ready to harvest the pears and the peppers and the apples. And so I'm kind of trying to make a commitment to myself to deal with all this produce we already have in the house today before I go down there and I bring a bunch more produce up here to deal with. So that is the plan. This celery probably should have been dealt with, I don't know, a week ago. But we're getting to it today, and I'm glad we're getting to it today. We also are going to make some dinner tonight. I want to make a tomato pie. Never made that before because the tomatoes are beautiful in the house right now. Some of these celeries don't look super perfect. But the ones we preserve are going to be perfect. I scrubbed out my sink this morning and we're going to use this to wash our celery. My number one priority is the celery because it needs to be dealt with today. But I want to process basically everything that is fresh and make sure that it's safe because tomorrow, meaning it won't go bad, tomorrow I'm going down to the garden. We're going to be doing a huge harvest. The apples and pears I believe are ready to harvest. We have a ton more tomatoes that I'm sure are ready and peppers. And I don't want to bring any more stuff into the house. Tomorrow's Friday until I have what already is in the house safe, preserved up. Because also on Saturday, I want to go to the farmer's market and get a bunch of things that I didn't grow enough of or I didn't grow any of and preserve those up. And then if you watched, I put an order in with a local farmer for some produce that I'm going to have to deal with. I'm going to drain this because this water is really yucky and dirty. And then we are going to fill it back up and re-wash everything for a second and third time. And I want to make sure that I don't lose anything that I've already brought into the house because I'm bringing more stuff into the house. So beautiful now that they're all washed up and we can go ahead and get these processed into a couple different things just trying to dry them off a little bit do with this celery. I want to keep some fresh for fresh eating because I want to make potato salad with homegrown potatoes, celery, and onions. So I'm going to go through and I'm going to pick out the nicest, crispest, because I didn't wrap these up when I put them in the fridge. I should have. I just did not do it. So some of them have gotten just a little bit soft, but some still are perfectly fresh and crunchy. Most of them are still crunchy, but not that they're going to stay super crunchy in the fridge for a long time. And then we will process the rest for a little bit longer term storage. Let's see, And ideally I could have saved a bunch of these leaves, but because I didn't have them wrapped up, some of them did get a little bit wilty in the fridge. So they'll last longer if I remove some of the leaves. The leaves that are still looking nice and crisp. I will preserve those up and I'll use those in things like bone broth and stock. So they're not going to go to waste. What I have found that works really well for celery and carrots to keep them fresh in the refrigerator a long time is after you wash them up, I like to wrap them up in either a paper towel or a cloth napkin. In this case, it's going to be a cloth napkin. Then I'm going to put them in one of these green bags or a Ziploc bag and I'm going to stick this in the crisper drawer 
And what the cloth does is allows for the moisture in the vet produce, if it's too moist, to be absorbed in the cloth napkin, or if the produce needs the moisture, it can reabsorb it. That is just anecdotal. This is how I preserve, or I keep my herbs really fresh in the refrigerator for a long time. I kept carrots in my refrigerator for four and a half months from the garden, and that's how I did it, and it worked really well. Unfortunately, I did not get that big of a carrot harvest this year. So this is going in the fridge, but last year I didn't get any celery. Now what I'm gonna do with the rest of this celery is I'm gonna process it. I'm gonna leave any leaves on here that are still looking okay. And I'm gonna cut the ends off if they're looking a little bit sad. And we're gonna chop this up and I'm gonna put it into this bowl. We have our compost bowl and our preservation bowl. When I'm doing food preservation, there's a couple things I think about. One of the main things I think about is how do I want to use that product when I go to cook with it? And I want to preserve it in a way that is going to be conducive to that. So I am going to preserve 99% of this for things like soups, chilies, shepherd's pie, chicken pot pie, things of that nature. And I personally do not like huge chunks of celery in that. I am going to both freeze this. I have frozen celery before. It freezes beautifully. You don't need to, I haven't found you need to blanch it. So I'm not gonna blanch it. And then I'm gonna do some freeze drying of it because I wanna test that out. I'm not gonna try to preserve this in a way that I'm going to reconstitute it to use for fresh eating like in the winter if I wanted to make a potato salad or something like that, where I'm gonna to wanna to put, or chicken salad, celery in it. I'm not going to find that very pleasant, I don't think, to try to figure out a way to reconstitute my celery in order to use in those types of applications. We're gonna use this celery for cooking with, so I'm gonna cut it up in the size that I would like to use it. We're also gonna use it to make stuffing at Thanksgiving, and I'm excited about that because I like I said I didn't get any celery last year but the year before I got enough celery to last me for two years so that's how it goes sometimes this food preservation thing can be a lot of work when it comes to you know processing this big bowl of celery and some of the other things we do but then when we go to cook with it it makes winter cooking a lot easier because I won't have to dice up my celery it is already pre-diced so it does save you time in the long run in the winter when you go to use your garden fresh produce. I love having diced up vegetables from the garden in my freezer that when I go to cook with, all I have to do is open the bag, pour it in, and I've got pre-washed, pre-diced produce, especially when I go to do some freezer meals this winter. And that is a year's harvest of celery. Super happy about that. So one way we're gonna preserve some of the celery is freeze dry it, but first I'm gonna go ahead and freeze it because I have the freeze dryer going. It's almost done, but not quite. So I think I'm gonna freeze dry half of it. And I'm just gonna freeze it on this tray so we can put it on the freeze dryer trays when the freeze dryer is done. When I'm trying out new preservation methods or new recipes, my goal is to try not to do everything that I have in one method if it's new because I don't know if I'm gonna like it or not. I know I like frozen celery. I've done this before and it works really well. So I'm gonna go ahead and use my vacuum sealer and I'm gonna put what looks like what you would use for one recipe in this bag. And then 
In this bag, I think I'm gonna do what you would do for two recipes in case I do a freezer meal out of it. I'll just put a Sharpie on it and say enough for two recipes so that if I'm gonna do a double batch of shepherd's pie or chicken pot pie or something like that, I can just open one and I save one of my bags. I really love my vacuum sealer because it definitely keeps things from getting freezer burnt more than using just freezer bags. For the first couple years I did food preservation, I only used freezer bags and they worked okay, but I used my sister-in-law's vacuum sealer last year and I definitely could tell a quality difference between the freezer bags and the food savers. Food savers do a much better job. What I meant by not doing my entire harvest in a new freezer preservation method is I've never preserved celery in a freeze dryer before so I don't know how I'm gonna like it so I don't want to do everything freeze dried just in case I don't like it so that's why we're gonna do half freeze dried and half frozen because I know I like frozen celery so now I'm gonna throw all of this in the freezer and then when the freeze dryer is empty I can put this celery in the freeze dryer something I just grabbed from out of the freezer are these pierogies we made these together I flash froze them on this tray so I want to get them vacuum sealed so they will stay nice and fresh for us. I think I need a bigger bag. I also grabbed a carbonated water. I think I want to have this be enough for two dinners. I'm going to cut two bags big enough for two. There we go. Seal one end. One thing that I'm doing this year for food preservation is I'm preserving things in their final state. So this was a way to preserve potatoes that isn't just, you know, canned potatoes or shredded potatoes in the freezer or anything like that. I have it already turned into a delicious meal that Josh and I can enjoy this winter and I can throw it in a pot, cook it up make a side salad and I have a delicious homemade meal with no effort and a way to preserve up potatoes at the same time. Now we have two winter dinners ready for the freezer and let's get going on tonight's dinner and because I'm pretty excited about it. Tonight for dinner we are going to make something I've never made before which is a tomato pie and I'm going to grab a couple different varieties of tomatoes I think. These are all from the garden and we have to process them before we can put them in the pie. Let's see, I think I have a yellow one. Yeah, let's get a yellow one so we can have a couple different colors in our pie. I'm not sure how many tomatoes we need exactly because I'm not really following a recipe. I watched a couple videos on it. So what we're going to do is cut the core out of the tomato. Then we're gonna slice the tomato. This one has a little bit of a kind of a crusty bottom, so we're gonna cut that off and we'll compost that part. Look how beautiful that yellow tomato is. It's so dense and delicious looking. How stunning does that look? So what we're gonna do is we're gonna salt these tomatoes. And what we wanna do is try to draw out a lot of this moisture so that we don't 
have a really, really soggy pie. But what we're gonna do is put them on this cookie sheet that is on, or cookie drying rack, which is on over the sink so that we can have all those tomato juices drip down into the sink. We're gonna let these sit here for probably about 20 minutes or so while we get other things done. We still need to make the crust and the topping for this pie. Let's get the pie crust made. I feel like I've been making a lot of pie crust lately. Next time I do a big bulk freezer cooking day, I think I'm gonna make like eight or nine or 10 <laughs> crusts and just get them in the freezer so that I don't have to do it every time I need some crust. I am making a double recipe on this, so this will put one extra crust in my freezer because I only need one crust for this recipe. I put two and a half cups of all-purpose flour in our food processor. I put some sugar, about a couple teaspoons of sugar, a good amount of salt, and now we're gonna put one cup of butter. This butter is so yummy, and this is what makes this crust absolutely delicious. My favorite way to make pie crust is in the food processor because it just makes cutting in the butter into the flour a whole lot easier. I like to pulse it in like this, and then once we have it all pulsed in and we have about pea size amount of butter, then I transfer it to a bowl. I find that I can't get a good flour to water ratio when I use the food processor to make the dough because I don't actually measure the water. I do this 100% by feel. I just put a little bit of ice water in there and I stir it up with a fork. A lot of times I will use half water, half vodka to make my pie crust because vodka does not create as much gluten. You get the moisture content you need when you're making pie crust, but not the gluten formation. Gluten forms in flour when there's two, there's two different proteins in dry flour. And in the presence of water, those two proteins come together and create gluten. And that creates a stiffer, stronger dough. But when you're making pastry, you don't want a stiff, strong dough. But I don't have any vodka in my house in quite some time. It's all in the form of vanilla, so that is why lately I have been using water, and it works just as good. So what I'm doing here is now that I'm happy with my water to flour to butter ratio, I don't like to knead my pastry. I like to work it as little as possible. So I take it and I push it together, and I try to form a ball that way by pushing the dough together. And because this is a double recipe, I'm gonna split it in half and we are gonna put one of these balls in the freezer for another time so I don't have to make pastry next time I wanna make a pie. Now, what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna use this saran wrap to my benefit to shape my pie pastry. I have found that it works really well when you go to roll out the final pastry. If I get this disc of dough into a disc that is firmly compacted before I go to roll it out. So I make it into a ball, I shape it into a disc, I wrap it up in the plastic wrap, and then I force the dough using the plastic wrap into a nice firm disc. The reason I like to do this is I feel like I don't have to touch the pastry as much and you want this butter to stay as cold as possible so that you get a flaky pastry. You can see that there's butter flakes in that. That's exactly what you want. When you get layers in pastry, it's because the cold butter goes into a really hot oven. The water that is in the butter steams and puffs up the layers between the flour and that's how you get flaky pastry. But in order for that to do that, you need really cold butter and you need a really hot oven. So now we are gonna go ahead and start on the filling part for the tomato pie. So I have two different cheeses here. I have a sharp cheddar cheese and a sliver of Parmesan cheese. We're gonna do a combination of the both. I like to grate my own cheese because you get a better quality cheese for a cheaper price per ounce and you're not dealing with the non-stick coating that can change the texture of your final recipe. But because it's not my favorite thing to do, anytime I shred cheese, I shred a lot extra so I don't have to do it the next time I go to shred cheese. 
This filling is so easy. All it is is cheese and you can use whatever kind of cheese you want, but I wanted something that had a good strong flavor. So I used sharp cheddar and Parmesan and then it's mayonnaise. <laughs> that is all the filling. If I had pepper, I would have put pepper in there, but I don't have any pepper. I'm putting in an order for Azure. I pick it up this week. And so I will have pepper in my house again. And I am excited to have pepper in my house because I love pepper. If you guys seen how I cook, I cook with a lot of spices and seasonings and I haven't wanted to buy it from the store because I knew I had this order for Azure in. And so I've just been waiting. So we're going to go ahead and prep the other filling ingredient for the pie, which is these onions and also our side for tonight, which are this garden fresh zucchini and these two yellow squash. So we're gonna use the onions for not only the filling of the pie, but I'm gonna also saute them up with these vegetables and it's gonna make a really yummy dinner. I just realized as I was doing this that we are having a vegetarian dinner. We probably eat vegetarian about once a week Josh does prefer to have a protein, but this meal is super, super rich, and I don't even know if he noticed it. <laughs> Actually, that's not true. He said he would have liked this. Well, we'll get to it when we do the taste test. The taste test is a pretty fun taste test at the end of this. I also diced up one whole head of garlic to put in both recipes, and I always have Tibro by my side waiting for me to drop something on the floor. Now that we have dinner all prepped, we are going to take care of these enchilada sauces that we made together. We ended up with 46 pints of enchilada sauce, and there is something that I wanna to do to them before we take them downstairs for storage. Now you may have noticed that I took all the rings off of these jars except for two because I wanted to show you something. Sometimes when you do canning projects, a little bit of the contents can come out of the jar and it can sit around the ring or even sit on the top. Now, when I had this ring on here, I could not see that. And that is just one reason why you always store your jars with your rings off because there can be food around this and on the top. And if you don't know that, that food is just gonna sit there under that ring and get really gross and disgusting. I think that I made two years worth of enchilada sauce here and how gross would that be if that food was just sitting there on the pantry shelf when you go to use it it's gonna be bad and you're not gonna to want to use it that's one reason why we take all the rings off another reason why we take the rings off is you can get what's called a false seal so at some point while this jar is sitting on the pantry shelf if this lid comes off you want to know that it's gonna pop off and if you have the ring on this lid it could reseal and it's not a true seal and especially especially with things that are pressure canned you that could be a dangerous situation so you always store without a ring on it and then you want to wipe down and clean your jars and to know your seal is good you should be able to pick your jar up by the lid just like that so what we're going to do is wipe down every single one of these jars and i kept the boxes so we're gonna put these enchilada sauces in the box and that's gonna make it a lot easier to carry it downstairs. What I ended up doing here was getting two dishcloths. One had a little bit of warm soapy water on it and one was dry. Because the enchilada sauce had some oils in it, I think, from the peppers, I felt like it needed something more than just a dry cloth. So I would wipe the rims down with the damp cloth and then I would come back and dry it off. We're gonna do the same thing to what I am calling, I don't even know what I'm calling this, but I have never canned anything like this before. I'm really excited to have this on my pantry shelf. This is something that I pressure canned. It's tomatoes, onions, and garlic. That is, oh, and salt. That is it. And I'm really excited about it because it's gonna make things like chilies and taco soup, pasta sauces, anything that you would want tomatoes, onions, and garlic in, that much easier because I'm not going to have to go through the effort of slicing and dicing garlic and onions. Now this was pressure canned, and you'll notice that there is very 
in degrees of headspace in these jars. That is because I had a weird siphoning issue. Every single one of my jars sealed, but a lot of the product came out of the jar. And I'm not sure why that happened because I left a proper amount of headspace on all of these jars and I put these in my electric pressure canner and I don't know, they just did that. It was super weird and every single jar still sealed. Those are my favorite canning lids so I can link those lids down in the description box, which I think says a lot about the lids because that was a lot of product to come out of the jar and have all those jars still seal. So I did the same thing with those. I wiped them down with a soapy warm water and then I dried them off. I put them in the box and those are gonna go in the basement. I'm gonna ask Josh to carry down all those boxes. And now we're back on to our dinner and I'm so excited to share this dinner recipe with you guys. It is game changer, game changer, especially in the summer when the fresh tomatoes are coming in from out of the garden. So what I did with those tomatoes, they probably sat there for probably 30 minutes or so. And then I did go every, I don't know, 10 minutes or so and I kind of pushed on them and squeezed out any extra moisture because tomatoes have a lot of moisture and we're going to try to cook them in a pie shell and I don't want to have a soggy bottom. And that's one way I'm going to try to ensure that we have a nice flaky pastry crust. Another way we're going to try to ensure that we have a nice flaky pastry crust is we are going to par bake our pie crust. I normally skip this step out of just laziness, but I figured with something like tomatoes and we're going to add some onions all that moisture is going to definitely lend itself to a soggy crust so we're going to take the time to go ahead and par bake it so i have my pastry shell rolled out and we're going to put it in our pie crust i can't remember if i had mentioned that i had put these pie crusts back in the refrigerator to chill while we prepped the onions and zucchini and we wiped down our jars just to ensure that that butter stays as cold as possible. I never cut away any excess crust when I make pies because I tend to overfill things. So what I like to do is turn over the excess crust and I actually build my pie up so that I can put more filling into my pies. So once I fold it over, I kind of pinch it so that it's a even thickness. It's not twice as thick where it's folded over. And then I take one finger on one hand and two fingers on the other hand and I make a fluted edge just to make it pretty. Now because we're going to par bake it, I put some holes in the bottom of that pastry. You could see how many butter flakes are in there. That's exactly what we want to see. And I'm going to take a piece of parchment paper. I'm going to put it in the pie crust and I'm going to put some rice in it. I do not own baking weights and that's okay. You don't have to have baking weights. You can use dried beans or rice to weigh down that pastry so it doesn't puff up. So we put the holes in it and we put the rice on it or beans or baking weights so that the pastry stays nice and flat and you can see how it didn't puff up. We bake that at 400 degrees for about 15 minutes. It's not fully cooked, but it has a head start. Now we're gonna take our absolutely stunning tomatoes and we're gonna to start to layer this. I tried to get as many tomatoes into this pie as I could. When we did one layer of tomatoes, we're gonna sprinkle on a few onions. I did just a note, probably cut about twice as many onions as I needed to, or not onions, tomatoes, and no tomatoes went to waste. I threw the rest of those tomatoes in the freezer and we will turn those into ketchup or tomato sauce or something down the road. Now, a lot of the recipes when I was looking this up called for putting all of this cheese filling on the top, but I didn't like that idea. So what I'm doing is I did one layer of tomatoes and onions, and then I put half the cheese mixture. Now we're sprinkling on garlic. If I had fresh basil, I would put fresh basil in this, but I don't because it is at the garden and I am not at the garden. So we're gonna skip the basil, but if you have fresh basil, go ahead and put that on. And I am trying to do a combination of the different colored tomatoes, just purely out of aesthetic purposes to make this really pretty. Now, once we had a layer of tomatoes, we're gonna put some more onions, some more garlic, and then I did put some more tomatoes because I wanted to pack this thing full of as many tomatoes as possible. And then we are gonna take the rest of our cheese mixture and we are gonna put this on the top. Now, I watched this 
recipe for the first time from the Holler Homestead and she did not use a crust when she made this and you could certainly do that but I really wanted to go ahead and try it for the first time with the crust but I think you could make it with or without the crust and it's going to be fantastic. I thought this seems a little weird the mayonnaise and the cheese but friends just wait until this comes out of the oven and wait until we do a taste test because this is probably honestly one of the best things I have ever made. It is absolutely incredible and really really easy especially if you you know used a store-bought pie crust you don't use a pie crust or you already have a frozen homemade pie crust in your freezer or you make one. <laughs> it is that good it is worth the effort and you just need a little bit of time i guess for salting and draining the tomatoes but if you guys have fresh tomatoes in your garden right now do yourself a favor and attempt this recipe i will write up what i did um, in a blog post and it will be linked down in the description box but there are a lot of different recipes that you can find online in order to make this now that we have dinner in the oven I'm gonna go ahead and start on the side. I put some oil in our big cast iron. I wanted to use my biggest cast iron for the most surface area so we can try to get a good browning on both our onions and our zucchini and squash. I really like sauteed onions and I wanted to get some good brown color on it. And so once we got a good color on those, I pushed those to the side so that I could put my zucchini and squash on the cast iron and I could try to get a good browning on zucchini. It can be hard to get a good browning on zucchini because it tends to get pretty soft. So that is why I wanted to make sure that these zucchinis and squash were sitting next to the cast iron and they weren't sitting on top of those onions. So that's why I put the onions to the side. I put my squash down and then I did not touch the zucchini for a good five minutes or so. I just let it brown up really nicely I did add some red pepper flakes. You can see there where that's the color I want. I don't want just soft squash. I want nice browned squash. <laughs> and I put pepper flakes on for a little bit of heat. When it was almost done, I put in our crushed garlic that we chopped up earlier. I'm gonna mix that in. I'm gonna let that sit again for a few minutes and get a good char on the other side. And then I'm gonna turn it off and that is gonna be this side for dinner. Now I did drop a piece of zucchini and Tibro got it. He's the one that's eating it right now. And Orbit was looking at me like, hey mom, how come I didn't get a piece of zucchini? So he got a piece of zucchini too. They are my favorite little pups to be in the kitchen with me. So I'll give them a squash treat. I walked away and I was sitting at my desk. I think we have boiled over a bunch of butter or something. Oof. Normally I put a piece of foil on the bottom rack of my ovens so that when things boil over, it doesn't boil over to the bottom of the pan or the oven, but I haven't done that here yet. So I need to put a cookie sheet or this, we'll put this here. Ugh. I think I still need to put a piece of foil or something on the top of that. I did put a piece of foil on this and I let it bake for probably a total of about 40 minutes and I wanted to make sure that the crust had time to cook but then at about 15 minutes before it was done I did take the foil off so it could brown on the top and that is our dinner. We need that pie to cool completely before we cut into it. Oh my goodness, look at that. Absolutely beautiful. All righty, Josh is home. We're going to cut into this pie and see how it turned out. I can see on the bottom of the pie that, can you see it's nice and browned on the bottom? So it's nicely cooked and it looks like it's set. So I'm happy that I pre-baked it because I don't always do that. The question is, the flavor of it. So Josh just got home, he's letting the dogs out, and then I'm gonna have him come in here and we're gonna taste test it. Look at that, it's set. You can see all the different colors of the tomatoes. So that's yellow and red tomatoes. It smells incredible. 
Look at how perfectly that's set. That could not have set better. All right, Josh is gonna come taste it. Look at the beautiful set on this. Oh wow, that's incredible. For something that you called a tomato pie? It's a tomato pie. It's just tomatoes, homegrown tomatoes, onions, our garlic. I have no and, idea what to expect. Well, and the crust is cooked. <laughs> so we pre-baked the crust. It smells really good. So this is uh, one of the people I follow, Holler Homestead, they make this every uh, summer. And I watched them make it and I had to try it. Mm. That's so good. Wow. Juicy. How is this not soggy on the bottom with this much tomato juice? Like, Well, I salted the tomatoes first and I put them over the sink to like get the juices out, but it tastes like pizza. It's really good. Wow. And it was easy. All it is, is our homegrown tomatoes and onions and garlic, homemade pie crust, mayonnaise and cheese. <laughs> That's all it is. Nice work. You can see the crust is cooked all the way through. It's Parmesan cheese and cheddar cheese. You can really taste that mayo. Please don't put that in. <laughs> Super good. That is incredible. And then we have our zucchini and onions for dinner. This is probably one of the best things I've ever made. It's really good. It's really good. Yeah. What if you added like some Italian sausage to it? You could. That would be really good too. Oh. It tastes like pizza. It tastes like pizza. It does. But like fresher, mm. like the tomatoes are fresher. That is so good. All right. So we're going to get ourselves some zucchini. We're going to sit down and enjoy dinner. Thank you for hanging out with us. If you want to watch more of my videos, I'll put some here. You can go enjoy between now and my next upload. I hope you guys are having a fantastic day. I will put this recipe down in the description box. I hope you give it a try, and I can't wait to see you next time. Bye, friend. It's really good.